so what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about setting the Bible. So yesterday, Elizabeth gave us a little intro to what your quiet time should look like. So today, what we really want to do is take a closer look at what setting the Bible looks like. Um, so more or less, the way that this is going to go is we're going to talk about why we study the Bible at all, we're going to recap how to do it, and then we're going to look at a passage together, and we're just going to get as much out of that passage as we possibly can. And then afterwards, if time permits, we're going to do a little Q&A, where you guys can just ask any question you want about the Bible. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to go ahead and pray, get right into it, so you guys are with me. Almighty God, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. And then he set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a great warrior runs his course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant born, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So, in order to answer the question why we study the Bible, I think first we need a definition of what the Bible is. So what is the Bible? I'm going to say this twice so you guys can write it down. The Bible is a collection of God-inspired books depicting the history and plan of redemption for God's people. I'll say that again. The Bible is a collection of God-inspired books depicting the history and plan of redemption for God's people. So if this is true, then all of us as Christians are called to, in some sense, be biblical scholars. We are to live our lives dedicated to the study of God's Word. Because if we do not study, how can we know that history and how can we live out that plan? It is by the study of the Word that we learn knowledge of God's history of His people, and we learn how to apply His plan for our lives every day. <laughs> that sounds like a lot, and you don't have to go to seminary to do this. Anyone can study the Bible. It's a foundational discipline which is why we talk about it so much, which is why we had a time yesterday to talk about how important it is as part of your daily devotion. I know for me personally, the time that I spent in my life really engaged in the Word is the time that I grew up most. And I'm sure those of you who have studied the Bible regularly feel the same way. And I know the leaders will say the same thing. And when I don't study the Bible regularly, I'm not growing. So there is a connection there. And so why does this work? It's because of the psalm that I just read, Psalm 19, because the word is perfect. It does endure forever. It does enlighten our eyes. It does teach us. It is true. That's why studying the Bible is important. It's the means by which we disciple ourselves. So once we leave here, we have an avenue where we can get daily growth without having the connection of 100 people all like-minded around us. We have the Word, God's Word, talking to us. So how do we do it? As Elizabeth said yesterday, there's three steps. We observe, we interpret, and we apply. Uh, and so right now, you guys already got a sheet that we're going to use as a worksheet for when we actually go through this passage together. 
But afterwards, in the back, there's actually a six-page document, which is just, this is everything that you could possibly do when you look at a passage. So I encourage you all to take a look at that and to use that. But running through real quick, and again, we're going to see all these things actually play out as we look at this passage that you guys have in your hands. Observe means looking at the context, the syntax, and things like word repetition. So it's a lot like when you were in high school and you went to your literature class that you hated, and you went through a sonnet or poetry or something like that, and you analyzed every single word, and you figured out what was there and what it's saying, literally, word for word. That's observation. From there, we interpret it. And so interpretation is crucial because in the Bible, there is one correct interpretation. And so we spend our lives devoted to trying to find what that interpretation is. So we use things like definitions. So you see a word that might mean something different in this passage, try to figure out what that means. And then you do what I call thematic cross-referencing, which we're going to do that today, so it's going to make more sense. But basically, you look at the way a theme is carried throughout the whole Bible and see how this particular text fits into it. And then you apply, you actually do it. How does this affect the way I think about God, think about others, and think about myself? How does it affect the way I feel about God, others, and myself? And how does it affect the way that I actually act in relation to everyone? Uh, so with that, uh, if you have your Bibles, then we're going to do Matthew 5, 1 through 12, which is the same passage as on the sheet of paper you already have. And so... Since we're going to be just studying this in depth together, there's going to be a lot of content here. So the point of this talk isn't that you guys would leave here knowing everything there is to know about Matthew 5. The point of the talk is that you guys can see, okay, this is what we're actually doing when we're diving into a passage. Uh, and it might seem a little intimidating too. You get better at this as you do it. So I've looked at this passage a lot of times, and whenever I give a talk like this or talk to people about this, this is the passage I always go to. So I'm really used to using this passage. You guys might be looking at this like, okay, how do you just get from here to here to here? If you have any questions about that, ask afterwards. Glad to help. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is we need to observe. So we're going to look at the context. Uh, so I mentioned that the Bible is not a book, which is probably what you're used to hearing, but it's instead a collection of books. So the reason I say that is because every book in the Bible is written for a different purpose. Um, even the, the four Gospels, even though they all tell the story of Jesus, each of them has a different purpose guiding why it was written. And so, since these are perfect books, very, very well written books with purpose, they usually let us know up front what the purpose of the book is. So if you want to turn over a couple pages with me to Matthew 1, we're going to try to figure out what the purpose of Matthew is from looking at the first couple verses. I'm just going to read these. The book of the Genesis of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Okay, we're not getting anywhere here, are we? Are we? Um, it seems like there's nothing there, but there's actually a lot there. And I think the problem is we're not able to understand the cultural context. So we're going to do a little illustration here. If everybody wants to stand up, I'm trying to find out who's still asleep, who's awake. Alright, so if you do not know what you want to do after you graduate college, sit down. <laughs> if you know what you want to do after you graduate college, but it is different from both of your parents, what your parents do to them. Okay, the rest of you, if you've ever changed your major, sit down. Okay, this is actually more people than I expected. <laughs> All right, so the people that we have standing left are people who are doing exactly the same career as one of their parents and have always more or less wanted to do that career. Am I right in saying that? Yes? Okay, you guys can sit down. So, uh, 
either Jeff or Jay touched on this the other day. I, I guess it was you, Jay. Um, Sunship is a huge theme in the model, and the issue with Sunship is that in this cultural context, in order to be the son of somebody, it means that you literally became that person after they died. You inherited everything that was theirs, including their land, their work. You literally became that person. Uh, so to say that someone is the son of someone isn't to say that their parents got together and had a kid. It's to say that they are, in essence, what that person was. So for this to say that Jesus is the son of David means that he's the son of the great king. He used to be a king. And for it to say that he's the son of Abraham means that he is one of the Jewish people. So really, if we're going to interpret this verse, this first verse, which looks like it's going to tell us nothing, what it's going to say is the book of the beginning of the reign of Jesus Christ, the king of the Jews. So the book of Matthew has to be interpreted in the light of the fact that we are reading a book about the kingdom of heaven, about Jesus' kingdom. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? Okay. So we can flip back to Matthew 5 and actually start to look at the passage now. The next step is going to be where it takes place in the book. So Matthew 5 through 7, if you look through, if you have a Bible that has uh, words in red, you're going to see that it's all red. There's no transitions between speaking. This is all one talk that's given at one time by Jesus. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And... Uh, we're going to ask what happens before it, and we're going to ask what happens after it. So before it, Jesus calls the first disciples, and he starts ministering to the great crowds of people. And so we see that in 4, 18 through the end of that chapter. And then afterwards, we see in Matthew 8 that great crowds start following him. 8, 1. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. So... Essentially, this passage is bracketed by Jesus calling people to follow him and people actually following him. So it's a very safe assumption to say that this talk that Jesus is giving is going to be about what does it mean to follow him, to be a part of his kingdom. So looking at verses 1 and 2, we're just going to dive right into this. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Does anyone see an interpretive problem with this? Who is the them? Is he talking to the crowds, or is he talking to the disciples? I think he's talking to the disciples, because he's just called them. And because, again, he's talking about what it means to follow them. So keeping that in mind, the beginning of this talk is going to be a summation. Like I said, the beginning of Matthew is going to give us the summary of the book. The beginning of this talk is going to give, him, give us the summary of his talk. It's going to be a summary of this is what it means to be a part of my kingdom. This is what it means to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. This is what it looks like to follow me. And so, as you look on the page I gave you, you see that there's kind of a pattern to the way these verses go. Everyone starts out with, blessed is blank for blank. So it's basically, if you are this type of person, then you get this blessing. So looking at that, okay, we want to be those types of people. So essentially, the application of this passage is going to be very upfront. It's going to be, do this, and you get something really great out of it. So let's just start with the first one. Let's get right into it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we need to define some things. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, the opposite of that would be to be full in spirit, right? Which would be completely full of yourself. So the opposite of that is going to be humility. Poor in spirit is people who are humble, who are open to being filled with the spirit of God. And those people that are open to that receive the kingdom of heaven. And so Jay talked earlier about the kingdom of heaven, and he alluded to the fact that it's both here and it's now. 
It's both here and now, and it's also a future kingdom. So this is kind of what I mean by thematic cross-referencing. So if you look back at Matthew 4, 17, uh, Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's talking about something that's clearly here, clearly now. But if you look forward to Matthew 19, 28 through 20, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And he continues to talk about this. This is in response to a question about the kingdom of heaven. So he's clearly talking about something that's in the future, but at the same time we're talking about something that's present. So can anybody give me what Jay's definition of the kingdom of heaven was? Anybody? Anybody other than Jay? <laughs> exactly. Anywhere in the kingdom, the rule and reign of God is being experienced. It's great. So, in one sense, we experience the kingdom now because we walk with Christ. So there's sort of a metaphysical aspect to it. But in the future, when we move into heaven, we're in a physical kingdom with him. So there's a now aspect to it and a future aspect to it. So those who are humble are able to enter into the kingdom now by coming into a relationship with Christ and be a part of the future because they've got been a part of his salvation. Okay, so the next one. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, there should be some sort of a progression here because, like I said, this is an argument. He's giving a long talk, so there is an argument to it. So it's going to build on the first one. It's not just people who are mourning because they're sad, because, I don't know, something bad happened. But it's the people who mourn for those that are not poor in spirit. It's people who mourn for the sin that's in the world. People who mourn for those that are not a part of the kingdom of heaven. And they're comforted because there is a there is a solution to our sin. There is a solution that makes other people able to be a part of the kingdom. So they mourn sin and they're comforted because there's a, there's a way to fix that. And so we see how humility leads into mourning. And so we continue to see how much we actually need God. So they grow on each other. The next one. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness sounds like it's very similar to poor in spirit. But really, it's, if you look it up in a dictionary, it's probably a lot more closer to gentleness. Uh, something along the lines of an old word that we don't hear very much anymore, temperance. And so this mourning leads to temperance or meekness. And the result of that is that we inherit the earth. Okay, so that sounds really complicated. Is that like prosperity gospel, I follow God, I get whatever I want, I get extra land, it's going to be awesome. No. Uh, again, it's talking about the kingdom of heaven. I've got to interpret it in light of the fact that this book is about the kingdom. So really, Inherit the Earth is probably talking about the promised land, or the new heaven and the new earth, what it, what it means to be in heaven. Now, looking at historical context here, uh, Jesus is also alluding to something else. Because the Jewish people at this time had already been kicked out of their land once, been brought back in, they're back, now they're surrounded by the Roman Empire, who's basically on their doorstep, threatening to take them over again. So the idea of having your own land is a huge issue, because they're on the verge of losing everything that they have. In fact, uh, later in this same sermon, uh, Jesus talks about how it's better for you to cut out sin, a certain sin, than to be cast in the fires of hell. Well, the word he uses for hell is an actual place that's outside of their home. So he's saying, literally, if you guys aren't going to be a part of this kingdom, then you're going to be forcibly removed from your homes and kicked out of the land that you've lived in for generations. So, to inherit the earth means to be a part of God's physical kingdom, again. The next one, 
is, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. So looking at this immediately, I know what hunger and thirst means, and I know what it means to be satisfied of hunger and thirst, as all of us are going to be after lunch. But I'm unclear on what the word righteousness means because it's used a lot in the New Testament in a lot of different ways. So what I'm going to do is, knowing that this is an argument, I'm going to keep reading, and I'm going to come back to it and figure out what it means. All right? So skipping on to the next one. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So everything that we've read at this point is about God reliance. We've become poor in spirit, let God fill us up. We're mourning because of how much we need God and we need to be a part of His kingdom. Our meekness is gentleness in being a part of this kingdom and sharing Him with others. And then hunger and thirst, even though we haven't really established what that is, is needing something from outside yourself. So to be merciful is to realize that all of us, all of us, need God. And so as a result, we are to share that mercy and grace that He's given to us. So it's not just for us, but it's for everyone. And so as a result of that, basically what we've done is come to an understanding of the gospel, that we really, really need God. And so we receive the gospel, we receive mercy. Moving on to the next one. Sorry I'm moving quick. I just I really want to get the Q&A. Uh, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Okay, so this sounds very similar to righteousness. That in mind, I would say pure in heart means those that dedicate their lives to killing sin. Those that dedicate their lives towards turning towards God and following Him in purity. That's, that's what pure is, purity. Uh, so that must be different than what he's talking about when it says righteousness. So when it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, I think it's talking about a righteousness outside of yourself. So, a lot of times in the New Testament, righteousness is talking about a personal piety, personal purity, but a lot of times it's also talking about a social uh, justice, is the word I'm tempted to use. Essentially, um, to hunger and thirst for righteousness means to thirst for social barriers to come down, for all of us to be equal, for everyone in the kingdom to be together, united as one body. Which you see that as we come here <coughs> together, all different houses, different schools, we're united in the fact that we all are a part of this kingdom. So to be pure in heart means that you see God, and so because of the fact that you are avoiding and killing sin because of the fact that you are a part of God's plan. You're able to see Him clearer. And it goes back to what I said at the beginning. The more and more I read the Word, the better my relationship with God is because I'm just, I sin less. I'm more open to seeing what He has in store for me. I'm really right there in that relationship. Next one. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Peacemakers is pretty simple. Those who create peace for the kingdom. But sons of God is going to be a little more difficult. Um, and again, this goes back to the sonship theme, which I said is throughout the Bible. To be called a son of God is to recognize the fact that we were created in God's image, which we talked about in our men and women's time. God creating us in his image means that we were created to be like him. We are created to share in what He's created for us. We are created to inherit what He's created for us. We're, in, we're created to share His gospel, to do His work. So you see how the cultural aspect of sonship really plays in here. Specifically, though, here, with it being paired with peacemakers, means that we're supposed to be like God in the respect of sharing peace with people. So, God is a peaceful being. He wants peace ultimately. So for us to seek peace means us to be like God and one of his attributes that is most uncharacteristic of the rest of us. 
So this is a very, very high complement. Uh, next one. Moving right along. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Again, we just talked about what righteousness is in this passage. Uh, but as Jay said this morning, you will be persecuted for your faith. As you share the kingdom and as you're a part of it, you are going to be persecuted for it. So blessed are those who are persecuted because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so we see how the kingdom of heaven at the very beginning is repeated here at the very end. So it, again, it brackets the statement to say that this whole thing is about being a part of the kingdom of heaven. All right? So moving into verse 11, which says something very similar. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We have a, a shift here in syntax, much like the one that Jeff talked about the other day in Hebrews. Blessed are you. Not blessed are those. Blessed are you. It's like at this point Jesus has realized maybe they're not quite listening and I need to remind them that I'm talking specifically to them. So if at this point you were listening to this and thinking, okay, I'm not going to do all these things, this is the point where you realize God's actually talking to me. So blessed are you when you are persecuted because of the kingdom, essentially. That means you need to be making yourself poor in spirit. You need to be walking in humility. We need to be mourning for our sins and for the sins of others. We need to make ourselves meek. We need to be uh, temperate and gentle. We need to hunger and thirst that all people would be saved, not just the ones that are like us. We need to show mercy to other people. We need to be pure in our walks with the Lord. We need to make peace. Because these are the things that the prophets did, as it says in verse 12. If you do these things, you will be like the prophets before you. The great men that God sent out to share his word, which is what we are called to do. So, that's 12 verses of the Bible we went through in 20 minutes. Um, that's what it should look like when you study the Bible. Is looking at this, observing the verses, seeing what they say, and then interpreting what they mean so that we can get an application out of it. So with that, uh, we've got a little time. We're just going to take some questions. Anything anybody wants to ask on reading the Bible, anything I said that was unclear, uh, just raise your hand. We're going to take some questions. Um, when you're like doing this on our own, how much of a package do you recommend we add? That's a good question. Really, it's going to depend on one, time constraints, and two, where you are in the Bible. Uh, some places it's going to be easier to do more than others. So, what we did here actually might have been a lot. Uh, but at the same time, when you're establishing the context, it's really easy to go through a book all at once as opposed to uh, going back and forth between different passages and different books. Because that way, you only have to establish the context for the first time. And as you follow through it, you can see, okay, now I'm moving to the next part of this, I can see how it builds. Uh, so for us, it took you know, 20, 25 minutes. But if we had started already in Matthew, not having to have to talk about, okay, this is what Matthew's about, this is what just happened, then it probably would take half as long, right? Uh, so, a lot of people are going to re recommend different things, and if I were to recommend a specific amount of verses, it would just be my opinion, but it's going to vary from person to person, so do what you're comfortable with, and people can try for it and see what they think is good for you, that's what I recommend. Um, how important is it to go through those boring books like Jake said, boring books, like numbers, all this stuff? Exodus and it's really exciting to talk about Moses and them getting pulled out of Egypt and the 
plagues, all this stuff, and then you get to the tabernacle. And then you get to the Levitical Code. And then you get to the census. And then there's a fun passage where they go into the promised land and it's, it's a lot of fun and then they come back and it's actually a very important passage. And then you get a recap of the tabernacle and the Levitical Code and the census. And then you get another book, Joshua, where they go into land and it's a much more list of, okay, they killed this people, this people, this people. So that's what you're talking about? Okay, yeah. Um, so one thing that I think we kind of lost track of, uh, just generally, generationally, is the long part of the narrative, the suspense of it. So there's, there's two points to this. The, the first point is going to be the suspense of the narrative. We go to a movie like The Avengers, and it's action-packed the whole time. Every second is something on the screen that's just like instant gratification, instant gratification, instant gratification. And so we really struggle watching uh, TV shows like Mad Men, where you know not a lot happens from episode to episode, but over time it builds a lot. Well, the Bible's kind of like Mad Men. So you have to be able to... Uh, wade through the heavy stuff in order to get into good, good stuff. Because, and this is the second point, it all adds up. Um, if you haven't read the boring stuff, reading Hebrews isn't going to make any sense. When you go into your New Testament, you read Hebrews, it's like, okay, I kind of understand what he's saying, but really I have no idea what he's talking about. It's probably because you didn't read the boring stuff. The first couple times you read it, yes, it's going to be boring. It's going to be droll. And it's not going to be the most fun experience in the world. But eventually, once you read it, you know, the third time, and you get to that passage where it talks about the tabernacle, you realize, oh, the tabernacle. This is just like what he was talking about in the Garden of Eden. It's very similar to that. And it's very similar to the temple that Solomon built. It's very simple, similar to the temple that's rebuilt in, in the book of Ezra. And it's really similar to Ezekiel's vision of the temple at the end of Ezekiel. And it's really similar to what we're going to ultimately in Revelation. And so you start to see how all of it fits together. And then it becomes interesting. So my advice is to wade through it the first couple times. <laughs> and then to eventually study it. So the first couple times you're just going to want to read it. And then you're going to want to study it. Because it's going to be hard to study it unless you've seen kind of how it plays out throughout the whole narrative. And that goes back to the narrative and cross reference. Thematic cross references. There we go. Full we'll fun. Um, so you made a lot of connections and Uh, the God Who Is There by D.A. Carson is a good book. 
uh, goes through a bunch of different themes in the Bible. Just each chapter is a different theme, and it just talks about just how this theme kind of progresses throughout Scripture. It's uh, probably about 120 pages. It's not a difficult read, but it would give you a lot of stuff that you could study and think about. Does that help? Okay. So I would 
would say stick to one of the synaptics, Matthew, Mark, or Luke. But it, the preferences can be up to you which one you want to follow up with them later. How do you know if like, your interpretation is the right one? Like, you're going through and you're like,
what I usually recommend to the ESD or the NIV, but there's a lot of other good translations out there. Really what you want to look at is why was this translation written? What is the specific goal they had in mind? Because every translation is in itself some sort of a confirmation of the text. Because you think about it, do you know Spanish, perhaps? No? OK, well, let's say you know Spanish. And when you translate from English to Spanish, you're interpreting what they're saying or back and forth. So it's the same thing when you use the files. So you need to figure out what their interpreter files is before you can finish the bottom line. So with that, uh, it's probably at a hover time, so uh, I'll